Uh, thank you for joining this interview. It's a pleasure to be with you. As you have seen uh, a lot of changes as well as conflict all over the world, we want to ask what's going to be the kind of future of international relations after coronavirus pandemic? Well, in the simplest uh, way, I would say that the coronavirus is going to accelerate a number of trends that were already underway before the pandemic began. Uh, for example, we were already seeing a backlash against globalization. Uh, you saw this in uh, the British decision uh, to leave the European Union. You see it in the trade wars or trade conflicts that the United States has had with a number of countries. You see it in the tendency for the United States and China to begin decoupling uh, their economies. Um, the other part of this backlash was uh, increased opposition to immigration in a number of different places, in Europe, in the United States, and elsewhere. And all of that was happening before uh, COVID began. Uh, of course, what's happening now is going to accelerate all, all of that. We're seeing uh, both companies and countries worry about supply chains uh, being disrupted. And so they're trying to both diversify their supply chains, but also bring them back home in various ways. That's going to lead to a world that's less open. We're seeing gov governments imposing lockdowns uh, to keep their citizens at home and keep them safe. Governments are intervening in their economies more to try and stabilize them in a variety of ways. Governments are putting more surveillance on their citizens. And some of that I was going to relax afterwards, but not all of it. So my bottom line is we're going to see a world that is both less open, but also less free when the pandemic is over with. I read your recent articles about the coronavirus pandemic, and you mentioned that power and influence are shifting from West to East. And you mentioned about the examples of South Korea and Singapore. What's your take on that? Why do you think that power is shifting? Well, this is really a long, uh, long-term historical trend as well, and it goes back almost, you know, I would say, 500 years or so. Uh, there was a period where you had uh, first Europe and then the United States sort of ascendant, uh, and Asia was, uh, was not rising as rapidly and so falling behind in relative terms. But in the last 30 or 40 years, you've seen very rapid economic growth in China, also in Southeast Asia. Uh, Korea has done very well uh, as well. So gradually, the overall uh, balance of economic power has been shifting uh, back toward Asia. I, I wouldn't say Asia is ahead of Europe or the United States, but the balance has been shifting back, back there. Uh, and I think the coronavirus is likely to accelerate this process, too. Uh, in general, Asia has handled this better uh, than some countries in the West. South Korea did very well, I think, relatively effectively and certainly better than the United States or, say, the United Kingdom have. Um, and that's, I think, going to have a long term impact first on how rapidly they can recover economically, uh, but also on the overall image that they'll have uh, in the world, the idea that Countries will you know, sort of trust the competence of the government because they handled an emergency uh, very well. Do you think that uh, that way of conducting diplomacy will change the nature of diplomacy in the future? I don't think it will have a dramatic effect. I mean, the first point to make is that face-to-face uh, -face diplomacy is still happening. Uh, the heads of governments are still getting together when they have to. So we're still going to see direct diplomacy uh, when necessary. The other thing to remember is, you know, major powers still have ambassadors all over the world. Uh, they are going to be able to deal with their foreign counterparts on a regular basis. Um, and governments do a lot of communicating by telephone, by Skype, uh, by lots of other uh, arrangements as well. So it's not going to be impossible uh, for governments to talk with each other when they need to. I think the one thing that may uh, be harder to do are the sort of big international conferences where you bring lots of people together, uh, you know, G7 and G20 meetings, where not only do you get heads of state or ministers of foreign affairs, but you also get their entourage, their staff, a number of people coming along. There are ways of doing that with screening and quarantine and things like that, but that's hard to arrange for that many people over any length of time. Uh, other than that, I, I think the business of international diplomacy will still be conducted even in the midst of this uh, large global emergency.
We have a few questions about multilateralism now. So when you look at this COVID-19 pandemic, do you think it is possible to reach a multilateral cooperation or transnational solutions to uh, kind of mediate this pandemic? Uh, well, not only do I think it's possible, I think it's necessary. Um, it's very important to understand that you know, COVID is not a national problem. It is a global problem. So all countries have a, a joint incentive to try and address this. Um, now, that also means, of course, we have a joint incentive to try and come up with a vaccine or an effective treatment. And the best way to do that, of course, is to have lots of cooperation among the scientific community. So if a scientist in uh, South Korea or Japan or England or the United States or China comes up with an important discovery, uh, new knowledge about how the virus works, how it might be defeated, the more broadly that is shared and the more rapidly that's shared, the more likely we are as a, as a species to come up with an answer uh, for it. So it's very important to maintain that kind of cooperation as well. During the last few years, we see that multilateralism is kind of collapsing in every different domains. Uh, do you think uh, what's kind of most concerned area? I guess I'd say uh, several things. First of all, you know, multilateralism has taken some hits in recent years, but it hasn't disappeared. There's lots of multilateral cooperation going on still in the area of trade. Uh, the United States left the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, for example, but the remaining members then went ahead with the agreement uh, and completed it. Uh, I think moving forward, the most important area where multilateral, multilateral cooperation is essential is climate change. Uh, this is a problem that cannot be solved by any one country uh, unilaterally, and it's going to require agreement among the major greenhouse gas producers in order to address the problem. Uh, so there it's absolutely essential in terms of the future uh, of the planet and the future of human life on it. Uh, I think nonproliferation is another area where multilateral cooperation has been effective in the past. It continues today, although it's, I think not as much as it should. Is there any message you want to send to Korean people? Well, congratulations uh, for having handled the COVID uh, pandemic as well as you have. I know there have been some recent uh, challenges uh, in the last week or two, but overall, I think the response has been extraordinary, uh, and you're to be congratulated for that. Thank you for Great. joining this interview today. My pleasure. It's very, very enjoyable talking with you.